You have the floor. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Mary, for inviting me to moderate. Uh, so our theme for our next panel is going to be examining ways that we can use film and media, including social media, to amplify the women, peace, and security agenda more broadly in popular culture, uh, potentially reaching some of those people Rosa mentioned this morning who aren't likely to come to an event with women, peace, and security in the text. Uh, so I have with me up here this afternoon uh, Jamie Doby, who is the Executive Director at Peace is Loud. I have Suha Baba, who is the Executive Director at Just Vision. And Julie Kermelin, who is the Senior Producer at Let It Ripple Film. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Jamie. Right, thank you, uh, Jess. It's great to be here today. Um, I was last here four years ago, maybe five years ago. No, no. Yep, two. Wow. <laughs> God, I need to reflect on the previous decade. On the previous decade. Um, but it's it, it's great to see even in the two years or however long it's been, just how the conference has grown and expanded across sectors. And um, I really want to thank Mary uh, just for for your dedication to this work and for providing this space for the community to continue. It's really um, important. Um, so as just shared, I'm the uh, ED of Peace is Loud, and we're a nonprofit organization that supports and expands the reach of women peace builders around the world. And we use film campaigns and a speakers bureau to champion women peace builders' stories and voices, both in the mainstream media and in policy making. And our newest program, Mina's List, provides new technology and capacity for women peace builders who are running for political office, primarily in cash-based economies, where there are serious um, campaign fundraising barriers um, for women's political participation. And so all of our work is uh, at Pieces Loud. It shows women at the center of, of conflicts and peace building, uh, efforts across the globe, and really tries to make a case for the inclusion of women in all decision-making processes related to the peace and security of communities. Um, so I want to share a little bit about our origination story because it helps to explain sort of how we fit into this space. So we were founded in 2013 by a filmmaker, philanthropist named Abigail Disney. Um, she spoke here, I'm not going to say how many years back, five, five six? Okay. <laughs> before, before I did. Um, and she spoke here after she made her first film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Um, how many people have seen it? I'm curious. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so most of you know it's about the women's uh, the women's nonviolent mass action movement for peace in in Liberia. It tells the story of the thousands of women who came together to demand an end to the civil war that had been raging in the country for over a decade, and their actions were really critical. Um, they were a critical element in bringing about an agreement during the stalled peace talks. Um, you'll be hearing from the spokeswoman of that movement tonight, Lema Bowie, um, who Peace is Loud represents on our Speakers Bureau. Um, and Abby, she made the film because the story of what the women had done in Liberia um, could not be found in the media. So it, 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 there was no footage of it on the BBC or on, on CNN of them barricading the peace talks and intervening in, um, in the negotiations. Any media coverage on the conflict in Liberia was pretty devoted to child soldiers and bloodshed. And Abby, you know, she said of the women, um, she said, it's a quote, she said, it seems to me that if I had to risk my life in that way, I would hope that someone would do me the courtesy of remembering my name. Um, and so she started touring the film around the world to get the story out far and wide. Um, and it was her experience screening the film for women's NGOs. Um, around the world that led her to start Pieces Loud. She was finding and hearing from the women that were at these um, screenings that there was a real need for um, alternative platforms and pathways for women to tell their own stories of conflict and peace building. And um, these were so often stories of conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and, and, and peace building, and stories from their own, own perspectives. And she saw Peace is Loud as an avenue for doing that. Um, so with Peace is Loud, um, Pray the Devil Back to Hell turned into a five-part series um, that was on PBS called Women, War, and Peace. Um, and uh, it's been seen by millions of people all over the world, 80 countries, seven continents. And in addition to Liberia, the series profiles women in Afghanistan, Colombia, and Bosnia um, in different 
uh, conflicts and asks the questions, what if we looked at war through women's eyes? What if we looked beyond the familiar images and faces of war and saw women as witnesses, peace activists, political negotiators, and heads of state, and not only passive victims of, of human rights abuses, right? The need for the protection of women, it's part of the picture, but it's it's not the full picture. Um, you know, we've heard today, um, you know, this morning that while women are, are disproportionately um, impacted by conflict, they're also one of our greatest hopes for, for lasting peace. You know, we heard um, the study cited this morning that women's effective participation in peace processes increases chances that the resulting um, peace will last by 35% over 15 years. Um, and we've heard about how grassroots women's participation in peace, peace talks is an essential part of ensuring that um, communities' needs are addressed. So the series, the film series, really placed women there at the center of that discourse about um, global security. And to give you a sense of the series' impact, I want to read this quote from Milan Verbeer, who many of you um, know is the former ambassador at large for global women's issues under President Obama. Um, she's also the ED of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. And she recently said, just a few months ago, um, of the Women, War, and Peace films, she said, when Women, War, and Peace aired on national public television, it was the first time the idea was put forward into mainstream media that the full participation of women in public life is essential to building strong, vibrant democracies in the U.S. and internationally. The series made this concept relatable and urgent, and it changed the way women's participation and rights are talked about around the world. Um, and it's this idea of making women, peace, and security relatable and urgent um, that's really at the heart of our work at Peace is Loud. We've seen the films that we've worked on do that in many different contexts, and I think it's because of the power of storytelling, the power of, of stories to create empathy and understanding, to shift and change our perceptions. And I think Commander Lena Kaman, I don't know if she's still here in the room, but her remarks this morning, I think, are a testament to that. You know, she, she talked about um, a story that she heard, a human, a human story um, of the difference women made to the security of, of displaced you know, communities in Haiti that led her to explore women, peace, and security. Um, so to give you a sense of the types of films we work on, you, you saw The Uncondemned, some of you, so um, that's a pretty good representation, but um, I want to show you a short preview of a brand new series um, that we'll be releasing next year in 2018 on public television, um, Women, War, and Peace, Part 2. Um, so it's a series of four new films that look at war and conflict through the eyes of women. Um, you're the first public audience seeing this. Um, and you're going to see short clips from, uh, from the four films. So you'll see scenes from a film about a network of Palestinian women activists that emerged in um, the spring of 1988 to lead a nonviolent social movement. And you'll be hearing much more about that film from my colleague uh, uh, Suha next. The second clip you'll see is about the critical role that women played in the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. Then you'll see a clip from a film that profiles an all-female police force of 160 officers in Bangladesh, who in 2013 joined um, a year-long peacekeeping mission in Haiti. And then you'll see um, next a uh, film about uh, women's bodies as a political battlefield in Egypt following the Arab Spring. So, roll the, the trailer. So, what I want to share in, in the time I have left is more specifically how films like those in this new series can be a powerful tool for advancing main tenets of the women, peace, and security uh, agenda. There are three primary ways I, I'd say that we've seen um, we've seen the first Women, War, and Peace series um, and, and other films too, like The Uncondemned, successfully utilized within the community. So um, first, I would say the films, they, they can really inform and mobilize mainstream audiences. Um, again, because of the power of stories, um, they have a way of kind of uh, translating women, peace, and security issues for general audiences who aren't necessarily well-versed in, in the agenda, right? And speaking of the US specifically, um, you know, we think that's important because it's general audiences who are the constituents who are the ones who uh, put pressure on policymakers and politicians to change the way they legislate. Um, as I mentioned before, over 13 million, or maybe I didn't know, over 13 million people saw the series when it broadcast on PBS in the US, millions of others around the world, and 
we worked with the iSchool at the University of Illinois to um, do a sort of meta um, data analysis to kind of try to look at how the series was, if at all, kind of shifting the media discourse around the way that um, women, uh, peace, and security, those ideas were talked about. And so we sort of combined computational techniques, data mining, network analysis, and um, we looked at the, the topic Women, War, and Peace, and it was this, you know, this sort of empirical systematic methodology that's pretty unique in the documentary film field. I know, you know Just Vision, they do this kind of work also, and it's really important because we're really in the business of culture shift and narrative shift, and um, looking at a change in media discourse really helps us kind of paint a picture of what's happening. Um, and so uh, what the analysis showed us leading um, up to the series and after the series over a six month period was that there was a significant increase in the coverage of women in conflict from um, stories of women as solely victims um, to stories of women as actors, negotiators, human rights defenders, and witnesses. And these weren't stories that were related to, to, to the series. Um, two, we've seen that the films are used as an advocacy tool on the ground um, with practitioners to both build their constituencies and also to influence policymakers. Um, we've seen the films used um, to advocate for country national action plans and for more effective implementation of 1325, you know, across many different countries. And third is we've seen the stories used as an educational resource in the classroom and in training settings. Um, and uh, that's, of course, most relevant to this audience. And um, I think it can be a powerful resource for, for a couple of reasons. One, it really addresses, um, I'd say these stories address one of the key principles of 1325, which is listening to what women on the ground have to say, right? Once we're struggling for peace in their countries every day, um, you know, the women, peace, and security agenda is often perceived, I think, to be about women, uh, women's rights issues only, but one of its powers lies in the fact that it um, requires and calls on the UN and international actors to engage with women-led civil society groups. Um, and that consultation is really central to the effective implementation of women, peace, and security. And so in teaching, it's of course unrealistic sometimes and not practical, even on a budgetary level, to bring in women um, you know, inter internationally into the, the, the classroom. These films can really bring those voices um, to the table. Um, and so I'm just gonna share one example, I think I have a few seconds, um, uh, or a couple examples of how the films are being used in classrooms. And, and one um, is related to the National Defense University, um, NDU, was after, um, speaking here at this conference that the NDU um, screened the Women, War, and Peace film series back on, on campus, and it became part of an effort to incorporate Women, Peace, and Security into NDU curriculum. And it was Ambassador McGann who um, you know, sent me a letter after, they, uh, after the students screened the films, and um, I'll just read part of it, um, and then I know I need to wrap up. So he said, the screening of Women, War, and Peace has been an important part of expanding the Eisenhower School curriculum regarding Women, Peace, and Security issues. The films have been the centerpiece of a series on women, peace, and security here. One key result has been the decision to offer a 12-week elective course on women, peace, and security, which will be the first ever for NDU. Most importantly, this has been a student-driven process that has increased awareness of the importance of WPS issues. And he went on to talk about how WPS at the school is not a discourse on gender preference or, or promotion, that the goal um, of incorporating WPS is really to um, define an operational doctrine to undergird the development and implementation of, of strategies and policies um, that would lead to the successful formulation of a sustainable framework which would meet the foreign policy and security objectives of the U.S. and its global partners. And we've seen, um, we've seen those stories in, in, in a number of different contexts, which I can't get into because I'm out of time. So um, I guess to conclude, you know, our, our work at Peace is Loud, and I think the work of my colleagues here, it's very much grounded in the belief that stories can play a critical role in advancing um, the WPS agenda. And I encourage you, um, I'll be here the rest of the day and tomorrow if you're interested in talking about how to use any of our films in your classroom to incorporate into your existing curriculum, we would love to talk to you about that. So, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I had the honor of being able to join the curriculum consortium yesterday, which Sahana and Jamie so beautifully put together with Dr. Mary Brown. I could
couldn't be more privileged to be in this space um, and to be talking about something that I love dearly, actually two things, both women and storytelling. Um, and so really what I hope to offer today is um, in, in, in conjunction with my colleagues' work, um, sort of the power of storytelling, what we've seen work, and provide kind of case examples um, that we can hopefully draw on and think about applications and adaptations to the work of the WPS agenda. Um, as a little bit of background, um, my name is, again, Sahad Baba. I'm the executive director of Just Vision. Uh, we're a team of human rights advocates, filmmakers, storytellers, and journalists who utilize media um, for everything from documentary film to news media to graphic novels, coupled with public engagement campaigns to highlight the work of Palestinian and Israeli nonviolence leaders who are working to end occupation and the conflicts. Um, as a little bit of background, um, we were founded in 2003 in response to the lack of mainstream media coverage of um, the individuals on the ground and the communities who we believed were doing courageous and vital work, um, but were not being picked up, were not being seen. And that was actually founded on about two years of intensive research that we conducted from 2001 to 2003 where we interviewed 475 Palestinian and Israeli peace builders um, by, uh, it, broadly speaking and broadly defined. So you had folks who were working in the field of human rights, you also had folks who were working in environmental sustainability, you had some folks working on reconciliation and still others who were at the front lines of nonviolent direct action. And we were interested in understanding in a, uh, in, a, in, in a context where there was already a civil society that had been formed and where good, important work was being done, what was the successes and challenges and where could we add value to what was already being done in the field. And what we found and heard across the board, whether we're talking about Palestinian or Israeli activists and peace builders, or we were talking about women or men, or we were talking about any of the various fields that they were coming from, was that they felt invisible. They felt invisible within their own communities, they felt invisible across communities, and they certainly felt invisible in the international community. And because of that, they felt as though they weren't able to gain traction and influence and ultimately be effective in their work. And so Just Vision really emerged to provide a platform for these leaders. Um, now, we do our work through a number of means. We operate in the United States, in Israeli society, in Palestinian society. Um, our work has been uh, the sort of basis for briefings with presidents of the United States, um, senior advisors like Ben Rhodes and Valerie Jarrett, briefing the NSA, Foreign Service, and Diplomatic Corps. Um, we've also partnered with mainstream media outlets like The Guardian to air work that highlights what's happening in places like East Jerusalem and the impact of policies on local communities um, timed with the arrival of, of uh, the United States president in Jerusalem, for example. And likewise, we've also worked with pre-military students in Israel who oftentimes are at the front lines of contending with nonviolent um, actions. Um, university students and activists, women's groups, refugees, and students across Palestinian society to provide role models and success stories that help inspire and inform strategies on the ground today. Now, throughout our body of work, we include a gender lens, and it's a critical component of how we see this work for a few reasons. Um, for us, one of the key reasons is that the role of women in society is a key indicator of how pluralistic a society is, both at the moment and at the formation of post-conflict and political transitions. Um, the second piece is that we know that um, in asymmetrical conflict, nonviolent movements are um, have 100% are 100 more likely to succeed than armed movements. Now, interestingly, and this is drawn and inspired by the research of folks like Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth, Victor Assal, Marie Berry, um, the, one of the key indicators of whether a nonviolent movement is both sustainable and able to succeed is not the ideology of that movement regarding left, center, right political uh, formations or approaches. It's not how repressive a regime is, whether authoritarian or, or whatnot. It's actually that movement's ideology about the role of women in public life. Um, and the third piece that actually brings me to the importance of visibility, which goes hand in hand with storytelling. 
um, being able to celebrate and lift up the role models within society of women who are contributing to these efforts is critical. In Israel and Palestine, it's actually surely the case that there's a backsliding of rights for women in the region, as we're seeing across the globe in so many contexts. But women are fundamentally at the front lines, contributing in incredible ways, and yet um, they're not being seen oftentimes. Um, even in the case of nonviolent movements, in the rare cases that these stories are actually being covered, um, the media often goes to male leaders for photo ops, for interviews, um, and that uh, delegitimizes the crucial role that women are playing and also impacts their growth and rise in leadership, both in the movements and as, as well as political leadership um, the day after. So. Um, I want to actually share a, a sort of case study. We're working on a documentary film, which will be released later this year, and we're so excited to be working with Pieces Loud on that um, as part of the Women, War, and Peace 2 series. Um, as, as a little bit of background on that, we, we decided to tell the, the story of the women who were uh, in key leadership positions um, during the first Intifada, which is the first Palestinian uprising that began in the late 1980s. Um, the, the, the first Intifada was largely unarmed in nature. It's considered by most academics and scholars to be one of the most disciplined um, nonviolent movements, not only of Palestinian history, but arguably across the last century. Um, and yet, for those of us who have a visual memory of the time, the first images that likely come to mind are going to be stone throwing, Molotov cocktails, burning tires, military incursions. It's not a surprise. Those were the stories that dominated the headlines at the time. Um, but in reality, the movement was made up of ordinary folks. They were teachers and farmers. They were students and elderly. They cut across gender lines, class lines, religious lines, political factions. Um, and it was quite unified, bringing out hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in sustained fashion for several months and years. Um, as we conducted research around that period, because it's such a highly complex movement, one of the things that surfaced that was surprising to us, we knew that women participated in the movement. What we didn't realize was that women actually critically uh, ran the underground leadership for the 18 months that are considered the most disciplined and sustained and effective period of the movement. And when we learned that, we knew that we had a story that had not only a profound impact on what's happening on the ground today and in being able to transfer lessons learned to the next generation, but also um, hit a global theme that has uh, universal resonance as we're thinking about the role of women's leadership across the board. So, and so I want to share a couple of, can you hear me? Yeah? Great. Um, so I just want to share a couple of sort of key takeaways, and then I'd love to hear any questions that may surface from all of you in the post-panel discussion. Um, one, the first Intifada is important for us to take a look at both for its successes and its limitations. So often when we look at long-term conflicts, um, we, we, we lose sight of the historical milestones that have led us to the point of where we are today. In the case of the first Intifada, while it failed to achieve a lasting peace in Israel and Palestine, failed to end occupation in many ways, occupation is even more entrenched today um, than it was then. Um, what it achieved is significant and notable in that it generated enough pressure both on the international community and on the Israeli government to recognize Palestinians as a people with the right to self-determination for the first time. Just to put that into context, the main plan on the negotiating table up until that point was the Jordanian absorption plan. In other words, Palestinians would be absorbed under the Jordanian government, which is equivalent to an ethnic cleansing under international law. That's no longer the case. Um, the other piece that I just want to underscore is that on one hand, I care about this story being documented for posterity. I do believe that there is inherent value in ensuring that the stories of the many women who are, will be featured in this documentary are accessible to the next generation and that their legacy should be documented and recognized for their contributions at the time. But it's not for posterity alone. Um, stories like this, as Jamie, I think, beautifully put, have the power to have radical transformation in the way that we think about women, the way that we think about what's possible, and in shifting perceptions around deeply um, divisive issues like Israel-Palestine, and certainly on issues about women's role and leadership. Um, 
we have seen how films like our previous documentaries, Boudreaux and My Neighborhood, and hopefully this one, have been utilized by political leaders, by military officials, by security, to not only understand what's happening in Israel and Palestine more deeply, um, but to also think about what are the pressure points and what are the strategic avenues for change and who are the people who can actually affect change locally and on a global scale. And that's crucially important. Um, we've also seen the power of films like this to be able to shift into visual perception. So when we're looking at making the case for WPS and building leadership within our institutions around um, the importance of pipelining women into leadership positions, um, I think it's critically important that we find the influencers, sit down with them, make sure that they know these stories and these data sets so that they also are equipped to be able to make the case and in some cases potentially have a mind shift and have that heart shift that's necessary for this work to ultimately gain traction. Um, there's some really fascinating research that's come out of the storytelling field around the power of films and, and storytelling to shift macro narratives as Jamie beautifully talked about in the impact of having stories like WP that women wore in peace um, mainstreaming on public television and what that means for the broader discourse. There's also beautiful research that's been produced by folks like um, out of institutions like MIT, the University of Pennsylvania, looking at the impact on individual perceptions and um, building both empathy and that then translates for audiences into behavior change. Um, and so if you're interested in that, I'll save you the gory details of data. Um, for now, but I'm really, really happy to um, get you access to that material if it would be useful to you. Thank you, Sahad. Julie? Thank you, Jamie and Sahad, for it's been an honor being on this panel with you and learning about your work more deeply. And Jamie, thank you for moderating. And Mary, thank you so much for inviting us here to Jess, I'm sorry. Jess. <laughs> and, exactly. <laughs> um, so my name is, is and very thank you for, for, for inviting me. Um, my name is Julie Hermelin and I'm a senior producer at Let It Ripple Films. And I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about bringing this conversation into the popular culture. Um, our work at Let It Ripple, we make short global films for global change, and we we really operate in the mainstream space. Um, I'm a co-producer with uh, Sawyer, uh, with uh, Tiffany Schlein, who founded Let It Ripple, and also founded the Webby Awards. Um, and Sawyer Steele, we uh, co-wrote and produced a film called 5050, Rethinking the Past, Present, and Future of Women in Power. Um, and we also, off that film, uh, created a global day of conversations around gender equity called 5050 Day. Um, a little bit about the film. So the film looks at the 10,000 year history of uh, women in leadership and the progress we've made and the setbacks we've had and the progress we've made and the setbacks we've had and the progress we've made. <laughs> and, and ask the question, what's it really going to take to get to a gender equitable world? Um, and, it also, and it also looks at the challenges and opportunities for men um, as old stereotypes no longer work and gender roles open up. Um, and this film premiered at TED Women uh, two weeks before the election. And after the election, um, we decided to really double down on the issue. And that's when we decided to produce this Global Day. We've had experience with Global Days. We've done that with others of our films. We have a, a Global Day called Character Day that's in its fourth year right now which last year we had 65,000 events around the world um, talking about uh, allowing people to have the opportunity to have conversations about uh, the latest, sci the latest uh, social science around character development and how you can be better global citizens. Um, and so we said we decided to, to really double down on this issue. Um, let me PowerPoint. Can I do it the right way? On. There we go. Um, so, you know, in our in our researching of the film that we did, the, and our films are very pop. They're made for an internet audience. They're highly animated. They're deeply researched, 
highly animated, funny, engaging, emo emotional, and provocative. Um, but, you know, as we see, a majority of people around the world believe gender equity is very important. It's actually about 65% is a median. So attitudes are changing, and especially attitudes in the United States. But the actuality, the practicalities, are not there yet. If we look at this 91% in the United States, well, women are only 19% of Congress, 10% of our governors, 6% of our CEOs, and women make up two-thirds of our low-wage workers. So just wanting change, just being okay with it, like, that's not going to get us there. So what gets us there? So what gets us there, and this is kind of what we are looking at with 50-50 Day, is bringing intentionality behind that attitude, behind that change. So how are we making this, an how, how are we creating an intentional gender equity mindset? Something that we can work for across every sector. And, and at this point, I just want to talk about one thing, a little bit of a personal detail about me. I'm a single mother of three preteen boys that are virtual triplets, two 13-year-olds and a 12-year-old. And so I'm in a house of boys. I'm outnumbered. <laughs> I want them to pick their crap off the floor. <laughs> and I also really want them to know that it's not just women that take care of them. So I hire male babysitters and have. And got pushback from my, from my, some of my parent friends, my women friends, really, you're gonna go male babysitter, that's kind of odd. Like, no, actually, because men need to take care of children, too. Because I'm a working mother, I'm a producer, and I'm a filmmaker. And it's really important that a woman's point of view is central in the stories that are out there in the world, that women are creating these stories that you see on television. Because if there were more women filmmakers, Dunkirk, while a great film, but how many films have we seen where you don't see these stories? in the broad audience, Hollywood blockbuster films of an all-female combat troop, right? One day, that will happen, but not yet. Anyway, so I digress for a moment just to say that these gender equity issues impact everything. So um, I want this moment I'm going to stop and, and play the highlight trailer of our 50-50 um, of our day, and then I'll go to, on to talk about our record. So how are we pushing ourselves to make this change that we want to see? Um, this was a billboard in Times Square. Um, it was up for three months before 50 to 50 day and then after 50 to 50 day. So again, how are we making this issue top of mind in the general consciousness, right? So as people are operating in their, in their general lives, um, they're thinking about this. And I'd like to also point out that this is not called Women's 50-50 Day. It's just called 50-50 Day. And that's really intentional. And it doesn't diminish the need for women to be top-lined at conferences and um, in women's spaces and in the workplace. It doesn't, it doesn't negate that. But what we're looking to do is create a different space that everyone can participate in the conversation. Um, because men also need to have a space to talk about these issues of masculinity, the stereotypes that they butt up against. Um, we need to be able to have these conversations together. Uh, and so that's why we are, that's why we were, we were thinking about that with this name and also all the materials that we created um, have that approach. Um, so we, we like to say the 50-50 day is for all genders and all ages. And this is, this is our approach. We have a, a film at the center, um, discussion kits, millions of voices. Um, and the idea is that when you look 10 years down the road, you know, where, are these, where are the people today that are going to be our decision makers? They're 15 to 25. They're on YouTube and Netflix and Snapchat. And they're swimming in this, in this world of popular culture. Um, and so as I said, our films really are, my background is, a, is I was a music video director for almost a decade. So, and so that's where I'm coming from. How am I speaking in the pop cultural language? And so the film becomes a springboard for this day. So where does this change need to happen? Obviously it needs to happen in the women, peace, and security space, but where else? Well, 
it needs to actually happen everywhere, honestly. And instead of going somewhere else to make this change, we're actually inviting people to activate the change where they are, to be the drivers of the change locally with the communities that they're accountable to every day. And what the specifics of that look like is different depending where you are, what you need, and what you're knowledgeable about. So what 5050 Day does is it provides a topical framework, and then with the film and the discussion kits and this global live cast Q&A that you saw, we provide a simple like plug and play uh, a toolkit so anyone anywhere can create an easy and meaningful event to either jump into, to start talking about this issue within their community, or take the next actionable step from where they are. What does gender equity look like right here in this office, in this school, in this institution, city, my home? How are we holding ourselves accountable to our own benchmarks? And some of the countries, we, as you saw, we have 11,000 events. We honestly, we thought we were going to have 1,000 events. I mean, we were, the first year that we did Character Day, we had about 1,200 events. And so based on that model, we were like, oh, we'll have about 1,200 events. We were kind of bootstrapping it for the first year. We had 11,000 events in, in um, we had 60 countries hosting events. Germany, Canada, France, UK, Nigeria, Antarctica, Hong Kong, Poland, Australia, Guam, uh, Spain, Belgium, Uruguay, Mexico, Zambia. We have just something wrong. Um, so this is actually the poster that goes along with our discussion kits. Um, because Again, gender equity isn't a single issue. It's a lens through which we can look at everything. Um, and so what we've done here is try to really simplify some of, um, some of the top line issues. And you know, we're still like, this is something that's fluid. And we're probably going to be redoing it again next year. And we'll, we can all get in big debates about what is here, what isn't here. Um, we worked with Rutgers and the Wilson uh, uh, the. <laughs> the Wilson Policy Institute for Women in Public, in the Women in Public Service Project uh, to do this research, to put our discussion kits together. And again, we were really looking to make this accessible to a popular culture audience. Um, so, and, and, and try to create an easy way to have some potentially intense conversations. These events happen privately in people's homes, in people's offices, in schools, in nonprofit institutions. Um, and so each one of these circles represented an issue card. And on the back of these issue cards, these are in our discussion kits, were another list of five or six issues that fell underneath these issues with then a couple stats. Um, and then it came with a stack of question cards, open-ended questions, so that people could have springboards for, for, for rich conversations. Um, and so we like to think of ourselves as a place that's building a bridge between the work people are doing at research institutes and policy centers and think tanks and, and the popular culture, right? So we're bringing people, uh, we're connecting places that are seemingly, seemingly diverse as the Women in Public Service Project, as I said, at the Wilson Policy Center, and Funny or Die, right? And we also, and these are just some of the people that came on board. And we really, we are topic agnostic. We'll take everyone that wants to, that wants to come in. Um, and, and, a, and a lot of these places hosted their own events. They broadcast uh, the event themselves to their networks to encourage them to participate. Um, so how, to fit, how does 50-50 day work? Um, so as I mentioned, we have, uh, oh wait, that's right. So, um, this is our trailer, which you can see online. I already showed you the highlight reel, and uh, and here you see the here you see the whole picture. So how does it work? We have our film, we have our discussion kits, um, we have private events, we have public events and have panels, and then we had this global live cast where you really saw that mashup of you know think tank and policy and business leaders, um, and that streamed on Facebook Live for 12 hours. Um, and, and we had people that were, and we had people that could ask questions, and we were taking questions as that went. Okay. And so we're not, that's a picture of the discussion kits. And we also worked with a number of different social media um, platforms. And we like to, we like to think uh, that, that 50 50 Day is um, that we, that 
social media companies can make their own campaigns and tailor them around this idea of gender equity. They know their audiences best. And we invited them to participate with their own creativity. Um, Makers, for instance, which does incredible profiles on different women, they curated an entire section of our site with their films according to our category issues. So people that were interested in any of these different categories could go on and find profiles of people that are being very active in the space. Funny or Die made a number of these news flashes that you'll see up there. Um, Refinery29 did a whole site takeover of 5050 Day with um, Eva Longoria wrote an op-ed about the work of her Latinas in Fet STEM Foundation. They made an interact interactive pay gap calculator. And, and then some of the actual things that happened on 5050 Day during the Q&A, Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, committed to gender balanced um, guest bookings on his podcast, on his hit podcast, Ma Masters of Scale. No show with guest bookings has ever committed to that idea. Imagine if they would. Imagine if more places would. Um, Google and YouTube took the opportunity of 5050 Day to announce that they were going to be producing a show called um, a, co a show called Girls in Tech, and they're committing to gender equity, equitable creative teams, female directors with male writers, male directors with female writers. So, so these are just a couple of the things that, that ended up happening without a push from us. So next year, we're looking to expand and build this initiative. We're looking to make pledges. We're looking to find ways for people to hold their businesses and their companies and their homes and themselves accountable to these ideas. And, and what opportunity does this provide for the Women, Peace, and Security agenda? Perhaps this, show, this shows how this is actually not an outlier idea just for this, just in crisis zones and in conflict zones and in war. But this is actually fundamentally linked to every aspect of our society. Gender equity isn't a women's issue. It's an everybody's issue. It's a global issue. And the more that is top-lined and thought about by everybody, the more it helps all of us. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciated Sohad's work. Um, having left occupied territory of Israel in 86, a lot of the pictures brought back distinct memories and it represented it so well. Um, I was wondering, so in 86 7, Anna Ashrawi, female activist, was one of the main leaders, and she's a Christian. And I was wondering if, if you worked on whether religion, faith, a role, especially with, with the Muslim religion, I mean, a little bit more pronounced in the culture, because back then it was um, not so pronounced. I mean, there were Muslims and Christians, of course, but and Jews, but um, with the inter with Hamas and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, um, using religion, I'm wondering how these women overcame that. Sure. So we interviewed about 24 uh, Palestinian women who were involved in the movement at various levels. So you had folks who um, self-identified as illiterate, and, he, and yet they were the lead in transferring key communiques between the PLO and underground leadership. You had folks who were part of the political elite, folks like Hanan Ashrawi. You have folks who um, were everyday students who became the backbones of the movement um, and fueled it for almost four years. One of the things that's so remarkable about those interviews, and we talked, of, we interviewed many of these women multiple, on multiple occasions for hours upon hours. And when we asked the question about um, the role of religion in this, one of the things that several of them said and reiterated several times was that look, like, we would start a march in front of a church and end at a mosque. We didn't even think about the role of religion because ultimately this was not an issue about religion. What Palestinians were unified around and continues to be the case is that this is actually a liberation struggle, a right for self-determination. And Palestinian populations themselves are quite diverse. You have secular communities, you have Muslim communities, you have Christian communities, and beyond. 
one of the things that I think is fundamental for us to understand in prolonged and sustained conflicts um, and in, uh, in cases where you have populations that are repressed over time, you've, um, one of the things that we see very quickly happen, happening is the rise of conservatism in filling power vacuums. And religion, and we're seeing this globally happening, is quickly the thing that becomes co-opted. So where, what we often hear in the mainstream media is that this is a religious war, that this is something about Muslims and Jews who are in an intractable battle that's been going on for thousands of years. In fact, when you're actually on the ground, you realize very quickly that that's not the case. And I think this is one of the stereotypes that we need to undermine. Now, at the same time, the role of and the sort of co-optation of religion is something for us to be thinking about and to be concerned with. Um, and I was just, I just actually came back from Israel and Palestine, and one of the ways that a, a colleague, a friend, he's both a business leader as well as an activist um, and community leader in Palestinian society, um, when he, in, in response to the question that I asked him about the rise of conservatism across the region, he said, look, fundamentally, this is an issue of pluralism. This is an issue of pluralism around the world right now. How do we deal with difference? How do we incorporate the well-being of all of our communities? And the longer that we uh, uh, are in a position where we're in occupation and conflict, the easier it is for people to say, the concern of diversity and how do we hold all of our populations um, becomes sidelined. I think I heard it earlier someone saying, you know, in the context of our military institutions, in the context of WPS, so often we hear the argument of, I'm dealing with a crisis that's more important than women, right? And I think uh, to some degree we're looking at a parallel in when we, we um, are looking at the case of pluralism in the region. I hope that responds to your question. Do you want to make a film on female engagement teams in the UN? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic question. So um, we are a nonprofit organization. About 60% of our organizational budget is completely fueled by individual donors. Um, we, the remainder of our budget is, um, is fueled by small to medium-sized family foundations primarily. Um, and I think one of the things that is critical um, about the role of storytelling and what's possible in today's age is that a, a quality film that tells a compelling story can achieve quite a lot for, very, for, for relatively minimal resources. So I'll give you an example. With Boudreaux, our last documentary, which tells the story of um, a Palestinian community in the West Bank called Boudreaux, um, that in 2003 to 2004, um, they waged a 10-month nonviolent campaign to stop the Israeli separation barrier from being built on its lands. Um, the barrier would have cut through the cemetery, down the girls' school, and confiscate um, the vast majority of the agricultural lands of the village, which was the main livelihood of the community. And they end up con um, convening the men and women of the community uh, uh, sort of unify the political factions, so you have Hamas and Fatah and Islamic Jihad, and welcomes in both Israelis and internationals in a unified position. They're ultimately successful. Now, when that story was actually developing on the ground, um, in, the, in the few cases where there was coverage of what took place there, the, the frame that was um, in, the, in the media was that these were riots and clashes, and that the residents were breaking the law and order, thereby justifying the arrest and the repression of the movement. Now, because of the work that we've been doing, because we're on the ground, we knew that wasn't the case. That in actuality, it was quite disciplined, quite sustained, and used civil disobedience tactics that are reminiscent of what we've seen here in the United States and what we've seen work across the globe. And so we decided to tell this story of Boudreaux. Now, we released the film in 2009, um, and we ended up having the good fortune of a, um, a public relations company, Edelman, conduct a media audit to understand to what degree did, were we able to actively, effectively shift the narrative around the events of Boudreaux. So what they did is they looked at the time period from 2003 to 2011, and from 2003 to 2009, so pre-launch of the film, what they found was that 30% of media coverage around Boudreaux was generated during that time. 
the vast majority of the stories were um, told in the framework of this being riots and clashes and breaking the law and order. Now, from 2009 to 2011, so from the launch of the film through our public engagement campaign, what they found was that we generated 70% of coverage from the top outlets, CNN, New York Times, BBC, so on and so forth. But most importantly is that we had a 91% message penetration rate that highlighted three key themes. The important role of women in leadership in the movement, unity across the divide specifically around political factions, and the efficacy of nonviolent resistance. Now, I also come from a political campaign background and have kind of likes in that world. For folks who work on political campaigns, you could pour millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in a single communication strategy, and you're considered to be successful if you hit a 10 to 15% message penetration rate. So now let's put this into context. Boudreaux was about $450,000 to produce. Now that's not small pocket money, that's significant, but I just want to put that into context of the scale of the challenge that we're dealing with and what can possibly be done. And I think if we strategically leverage our resources, we can actually achieve quite a bit. Hi, I'm Sean Sullivan from the, the Naval War College. I have a question for Alia. Is that you're in this, in, this enterprise is a storytelling type of an enterprise. I wondered how do you select who tells the story and are there certain topics regarding peace really security type ventures that you do that it's more effective to tell in the first person versus the third person observer versus narrated? Sorry, um, do you mind repeating that question one more time? Yeah, if, what I'm talking about is how do you determine who tells the story? Because all these tell you know stories. So how do you determine what perspective you want? Are there certain topics that are best in the first person versus narrated? You go first, <laughs> or do you want me to go first? I think it really depends on the story. I don't know if I can answer that universally. I mean, I think that with our work, um, it's very important that we are allowing the women to tell their own stories. The women who are in these conflict areas, they're not behind the camera, however. Um, and, and is that what you're asking? It's sort of whose story is this to tell? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there's always an inherent subjectivity in, in any documentary film because you're always looking at it, you know, you can be as objective as you, you know, you, you try to be objective and present the truth as, you know, you see it, but it's always told through a lens and it's your lens, the person who is behind the camera. I mean, I think in a perfect world, I don't know if you would, if you would agree with this, um, uh, the people whose stories are being told would be telling the stories also. I think that's, just not the reality um, in terms of resources and training and the world we live in. Um, but I think, you know, there was a second part to your question. Yeah, like, are there certain topics that, that are... Oh, there are certain topics. Best delivered by first person or best delivered by narration or people that observe the people. You know, I think about like credibility issues and, you know, political bends or ideological bends. You know? yeah. do, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll just ground in kind of our approach at Just Vision and speak to um, the questions that I think are relevant in our context. Um, so there are there's a couple of key principles about the kinds of stories we tell. One, they've got to be homegrown. So one of the things that we knew on the, this question of credibility is that um, so often on the issue of Israel and Palestine, you'll often hear where are the Israeli where are the Israeli solidarity activists or where are the Palestinian Gandhis, right? Um, and there's a sensitivity and a really important sensitivity to pay attention to about external um, forces imposing Gandhian style nonviolence or sort of MLK style nonviolence on the Israeli Palestinian context. And what that actually um, kind of subverts is the fact that there's already several local strategies and examples that can inspire and motivate and move people without running into the sort of power dynamics that may play out if you're bringing in a story that's external, 
right, as a, as a model. So it's really important to us that the stories are homegrown and that they're stories that are being told through the perspective of the individuals and the communities that are being reflected. That's one. The second piece to, um, for us, one of the, we've actually talked about this piece about narration. Do you have a narrator or do you not? And so on. That was a big piece about the story of the first Intifada that you saw. Part of the problem with that film is that it's 30 years ago, so your access to archival materials are quite limited already by virtue of this being a historical documentary. You include the fact that a lot of the individual's materials of folks who were documenting for themselves got destroyed as part of um, a military campaign to destroy evidence of what happened. And you have really limited materials. So we actually oscillated between, okay, do we bring in a narrator or do we find another way to bring the story to life? We decided not to have a narrator for a couple of things. One, it's a, a, in this case, it took away from the stories of the women themselves. Um, and the other piece is that um, it imposes a lens that um, on this issue, um, oftentimes people question the credibility of voices. And so having the credibility of the, the individual speaking for themselves is actually was really important to us. And so what we ended up doing is we filled in areas where we lacked media contents um, to sort of illustrate the story with animation, right? Um, so that, you know, and everything's gonna be a case by case basis. The second sort of, a, you know, the second point that I'll just make is that for Just Vision, it's really important that we're accountable storytellers. Um, what does that mean? So with the story of Boudreaux that I had just described um, previously, there were several different key protagonists. You had Ayat Morar, who was the sort of lead community organizer who began the campaign. You have his daughter, Iltizam Morar, who organizes the women's contingent. You had Yasmin Levy, who was an Israeli border police, who was a um, patrol person who was confronted with the nonviolent demonstrations on a daily basis. You have Jerome Spielman, who was the Israeli commander, who was overseeing those events. And then you have folks like Kobe Smith, who's an Israeli activist who was involved. Before we launched the film, it was really important to us that we reach out to each of them to show them the film for two things. One was accuracy, making sure that we have the story correct. It were highly researched and fact-based. So we had done our work, but we wanted to make sure it lined up with their experience and telling of the story. The second piece was harm. We didn't want to make, we wanted to make sure that we were doing no harm so that um, if there were incidents where it could potentially lead to damaging consequences, either as political retrib retribution or um, kind of alienation within the community or so on and so forth, we would take that into consideration in our edit. Um, so those are some of the sort of principles that we think about from storytelling lens and, and the determinations that we make. I was just going to add, I was, I was just going to add one quick thing to that, which is, you know, documentary filmmakers, they often get criticized for uh, not being balanced and not showing all perspectives and all sides, and I, I often see filmmakers trying to, you know, um, you know, defend their decisions. And I think the reality is, it's. I, I think that you you show a point of view, and it's it's partly. I mean, it pieces loud. Our job is to take the film and to figure out how to maximize, you know, the social impact of the film, um, but also how to give the context necessary to be able to understand the full picture. You know, the film is a point of view always, but it's a piece of a larger conversation. Yeah, I'm good. Two more questions, okay. okay. Um, so thank you all for your presentation. I'm really interested in what you were kind of all talking about, which is uh, getting to culture shift, culture change. And Julie, your project is primarily via social media, the web, and then some of the, your films are more traditional media, right, which you people. And I guess I'm wondering, from your experience in those different um, outlets, what do you think is next? I mean, we didn't have these films four or five years ago. This kind of media didn't exist now. It's really exciting than it does. But now that you're doing it, what do you think is the next lever? Because uh, if we're talking about amplifying this agenda, you know, for the next decade, how do you, what do you guys see from where you're sitting in terms of culture shift and, and shaping the message and what kinds of things you may not be thinking of to be 
using right now that we could be using? Or is there, a, is there another direction that we're not seeing as experts um, in the field, but we're not experts in media or communication, right, that we could be using better? Um, so as you're looking at your resources in your classrooms in general, um, I, I want you to be really aware of who is presenting the story, no matter what story it is that you're having presented. There's this thing in Hollywood called the Bechdel test, <laughs> and I don't know how many people know this, the Bechdel test, which is, uh, it's actually this woman, Alison Bechdel, who has a, is a graphic novelist and has a play on Broadway right now, but it's how many lines, um, how many speaking lines a woman has in a film. And if the film doesn't pass the Bechdel test, and unfortunately, many, many films don't. So think about, and at, at its most base level, think about who's delivering this culture's media to, to your groups. When you're, when you're using language in your textbooks, what's the gender of the language that you're using? Are you using gender neutral language? I mean, these, this isn't as huge as, as these stories, and I don't want to diminish that, but when you're talking about things like unconscious bias, which is really key, and in America right now, I was in a room of phone bank people, and the, it was being covered by a news story. It, the room was all women except for one man, and the reporter came in and went to the man to ask the question about the experience of being, of doing phone banking. And I turned to the camera person and I said, that's not, a, that's not okay, that's not appropriate because we're in a room full of women right now who are, making, who are doing these phone banks. And this is actually the case in journalism, in news, that most of the time it's men that are telling the story. Um, they're the ones on the ground talking. So, so in your curriculums, think about that. Think about where is there a woman's story that can illustrate this same general point that might illustrate it that isn't just a woman's story. Just it just so happened to be coming a film that women's going to be in. A girlfriend of mine um, is a filmmaker, and her film company is called Topple Productions for Topple the Patriarchy. And she has a line that says, "If we can, women can make films, women can make films for the next 150 years only, and we won't begin to catch up with the amount of media and the writing and the literature that was written by men about men." So you have the agency to at least choose what it is. to say, I don't think the future is in virtual reality, whatever people can tell you. <laughs> um, I, I often joke, I don't think it's really joke, I think it's true that like, women, peace, and security is a growth industry. I think we all made a good decision. I think that, um, I mean, I think that these issues are only becoming more and more relevant and the demand is growing and thinking about security um, uh, in a, in a broad way, I think, is, is happening more and more. In terms of um, platforms, though, for, for these stories, I mean, I think online short-form content is the future. You know, I think that um, in terms of documentary, things like, you know, Op Docs and, and The Guardian and, um, you know, these sort of short, even three to five minute, um, you know, films are what people are wanting. They're these kind of bite-sized, um, these bite-sized stories, I think, you know, also, and I know that there's, you know, the argument do you, in terms of influencing um, decision makers, which is part of the, the culture shift, is it, is it the stories that, you know, they need, is it the data, is it the stories, is it the data, I feel like you hear different things every week, it's like one week they need more data, the next week they need more stories, and we talked about this a little bit, um, you know, yesterday, but in terms of the data, um, you know, last night we had a conversation with E.J. Graff, who's the managing editor of the Monkey Cage at the Washington Post, and I think that that's a great model that we're going to see a lot more of in the future. You know, it's it's recognizing that there's so much academic research out there um, that is uh, really, really valuable and isn't being translated to a popular audience. It's staying in, you know, folders on, on desks and in, in, in classrooms, and what the Monkey Cage is doing is, um, you know, uh, finding these these academics to uh, write their research for a popular audience, and their readership is 
huge. And they're, you know, state, UD, they're people who are relying on, um, on this research because it's something that is consumable and it's, um, and it's packaged in a way that is actionable. So I think we're going to see more and more platforms like the Monkey Cage. Um, okay, so a couple, I think I'm going to respond to it in a slightly different way, um, hopefully for a breath. Um, so the first piece that I would say is that when we talk about culture shift, we're talking about something massive, right? And so much of the time we think about this in terms of scale. If we're bigger and badder, then we're going to get more impacts. One of the things that I think that we um, need to assess is who do we need to reach? Who's critical in driving the mainstream conversations and how do we reach them? So, so much of the, the work that we do on Israel-Palestine, we're a small and nimble team, right? It's an assessment of resources compared to what kind of impact we want to have. So our strategy is actually on two levels. One, it's looking at how do you shape the social norms on this issue, and that's looking at key audiences like the press and journalists, um, editorial boards, um, thought leaders at global platforms like World Economic Forum, Ted Global, um, access to sort of thought leaders who have the power to reach broader constituencies. It's also looking at who are the key populations that are key stakeholders in this issue. Um, here in the United States, for example, that looks like faith communities and traditionally monolithic faith communities, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faith communities. It looks like university students, um, both because of the historical role students have played on galvanizing social change efforts in the United States, but also because university campuses are one of the key hubs for activation on Israel and Palestine. Um, likewise, within that same sort of rationale, it's reaching the educators who we know are key access points to students in terms of being able to shape or not shape their political views and world views at a very crucial moment in their development their, and their political development. Um, so it's it's one, the first piece is thinking about target audience becomes really key when you're looking at culture, creating culture shift and incremental culture shift. I think the other piece that I would note is thinking about what is the right medium for the right aim, like end. And I'll give you a story that from our own evolution and lessons learned, I think of Just Vision more as an organism than an organization. Um, constantly reevaluating ourselves and constantly reevaluating based on changing dynamics in the field and in the media industry and, and globally. Um, several years ago, with our last film, Boudreaux, um, we had, we applied the same sort of multi-pronged strategy um, in the United States, in Israel and Palestine, where we're looking to shape social norms at the sort of culture level and also reach key target audiences. In Israeli society, one of the things that we were running into was that on a community by community basis, we were seeing pretty um, sort of mind-blowing individual transformations. So we were working with pre-military students, for example, in Israel who were inscripted in the military and opted into an educational gap year um, that is meant to enhance their military service. These are uh, sort of your elite students. They go on to oftentimes become commanders of military units and hold prestigious roles in uh, the political and media spaces. And we would screen films like Boudreaux, and afterward folks would say, knowing what I know now, I can't possibly serve. That's a mind-blowing transformation. Now, part of the challenge, though, was that at the same time in Israeli society, we were seeing a rightward swing, where increasingly so you were seeing uh, the Israeli public both become more conservative in their views vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, and also electing officials who had really troubling racist um, sort of ideologies around Palestinians. And there was a shrinking space for civil society. And in that environment, we started to ask the question of, is our strategy through film um, sufficient in achieving our broader aims? And we actually came back and said, alone, that strategy is not working. We're not able to penetrate the mainstream media space. And we were trying. We would see, you know, on occasion, we would have amazing journalists who would write beautiful stories that capture the holistic nature of a movement and a community. It goes through that editorial board, it gets that out, and it's hardly recognizable. Or we would work with a journalist who would say, you know, like, um, who would pick up the language of nonviolence, but it would become uh, kind of exceptional in its frame. So it's the good Palestinian who's doing this. And for us, we were like, wait a second, that's actually re the very stereotypes that we're trying to um, undermine here. So we took a step back and we said, 
how do we actually reach the mainstream? Let's go back and do a needs assessment. We sat down with editorial boards and journalists, and they were quite honest with us. They said, look, um, there's either no appetite in the Israeli public for the kinds of stories that you want to tell on human and civil rights issues, or they would say it's not politically viable. Those were the two responses. And we said, okay, well, in that scenario, um, what can we do to influence the mainstream public narrative? We decided to launch our own news site. Now, when we decided to do that, many of the folks in the field kind of looked at us like we were going to fail. They looked at us like we were going to fail. And they said it was a ludicrous idea, and there's no way you're going to gain traction in that space. And there's no way that the mainstream public is going to pick up on this. Um, it's been three years. We have 2.5 million unique readers to date. To put that into context, it's about a, a population of 8 million in Israel. So we're talking about reaching one out of every four Israelis. The same mainstream media outlets that said that these stories wouldn't fly in the Israeli public are now seeking us out to partner on our content because we're seen as more credible in very specific constituencies that now are seeding us stories that we're scooping and we're the only ones that have access to them. Um, similarly, we know that political leaders across the political spectrum, even if they disagree with our position or our orientation or our value system, um, are paying attention to our content because they're either calling us for exclusive interviews or they're, um, they are calling us to ask us why we would publish something along the lines of what we publish. So in that context, I think you know, the, the takeaway for me is adapt, adapt, adapt. Um, ask yourself really what are you trying to achieve and who are you trying to reach and build your strategy from there. I always say that goals lead, strategy follows. Um, so identify what your goal is and then work backwards. Um, this is similar with you know, our adaptation of Boudreaux's the film to a graphic novel. We realized several years back that um, when we were thinking about getting, um, when we're thinking about who we're reaching in Palestinian society, we were missing a key contingent. So we were working primarily with university students across the board. Palestinian society is incredibly young. You have 70% of the population is under the age of 30. What that means is university students are not sufficient. You're actually seeing students getting politicized at high school and middle school. And so we said we need to reach a younger audience there. Documentary films were, are actually quite a hard medium for that audience. So we said, what is the other medium that we could utilize here? Graphic novels are actually quite important and as a way of storytelling. So that was an adaptation. So I think our mediums today are vast. So we have different ways of actually reaching our goals. So that's one piece. I think the other piece is um, to, um, to be I think we have, while we have channels like social media and we're seeing really amazing things like Monkey Cage and so on um, emerge, the constant question that we should be returning to and asking ourselves is in an environment where there's information saturation, now this is going back to the question of unconscious bias, um, we as people naturally gravitate to information that reaffirms our worldviews. So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is if this is an issue and WPS, if we're dealing with an issue that is actually about shifting the way that people see the world, then we actually, that needs to be part of how we're thinking about our strategy for distribution. What are the kinds of stories, what are the means to actually get people to sit down in an immersive story and actually sit through and absorb a narrative that they may disagree with otherwise, right? And this is where documentary film becomes incredibly powerful. And I would actually so, add, if this is actually something that virtual reality, I'll add, this is, something, this is something of virtual reality. One last comment. There it is, that's something of virtual reality for, I think, could be, you don't want to say that that is, you know, a future tool, <laughs> but having experienced some of the, some of those, um, some of the virtual reality films, especially the ones that are working in the political space, they can be very impactful. Really appreciate it. Thank you. A round of applause for our final panel.